So, this is where cypherpunk meets organized crime. A little bit about myself. Uh, I work for, uh, my day job is with Akamai Technologies. Um, a lot of my research sort of overlaps with my day job, so I don't actually know how many hours a week I work, uh, which is great because um, all of my hobbies I get to get paid for. Um, I do mostly dark web, underground economy, organized crime um, research, and uh, I do advanced CISP training. Uh, I do not have a CISP. And uh, I do incident response, both internally and for our customers. Uh, and I get to be a chaos monkey around the company, uh, just like smashing random networks and shit and then helping them put them back together uh, in a more resilient fashion, which is a lot of fun. All right, so to give you some context for this talk, uh, what is in scope is uh, things like e-banking, e-commerce, digital currencies, digital marketplaces, uh, and digital economies. What I am not talking about is general freaking hacking and cracking uh, that doesn't necessarily have a focus that is financially motivated. Um, so some definitions to start off with. If you saw Johnny's talk, he probably also went over these. Uh, deep web, dark net, dark web, dank net, um, dark, 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 yeah. Uh, so they are distinct, even though the media will use them interchangeably. Uh, dark nets are the actual frameworks, uh, and we'll go over some different ones other than Tor. Um, and then uh, the dark net would be on top of those uh, or, or the dark web would be on top of those dark net frameworks, which of course all of that is on top of the regular internet unless you're using a mesh network, which there's no really big dark nets right now that are mesh based. All right, so we're gonna start at the beginning when we first started really seeing um, sort of e electronic fraud that was financially motivated. And I'll start with uh, three stories. Um, about, uh, these are real scams you can see in the newspaper. Um, so the first one was uh, network admin training, uh, where this uh, school for uh, network admin training would teach you how to be a network admin, but you had to prepay before you had the classes. So you would prepay, and then they would uh, guarantee you a job at uh, a large name company. And so, what would happen is you would prepay and then they would give you really like, I don't know, an hour of training and then just blow you off for the rest of the training. Um, and then of course they were, they were not affiliated with the large company at all and could not get you a job there. So when you went to the company and said, hey, I was guaranteed a job, they're like, oh yeah, you totally got scammed by that school. Um, and that stuff like that is happening today. Um, and uh, the, the next one, that is a throwback that is still happening today. Of course, uh, international banking and wire fraud. And uh, this is typically where somebody is in uh, a country and they say, oh, I, I'm traveling, you know, I, I gotta call my bank. Um, and uh, pose, they're gonna pose as somebody else and say, I'm traveling, I just got mugged, I don't have any ID on me, I don't have my passport, I need you to wire money to, I don't know, Turkey or wherever you are. Um, and this is social engineering, of course. They're pretending to be somebody else. It's identity fraud. Uh, and the banks do fall for it. Um, and uh, this particular uh, instance that I'm talking about is it was uh, happening in Turkey. There was a criminal uh, group in Turkey that were um, doing wire fraud against banks in Paris and London. The third story, which is really cool, this, this happened in India. Uh, where there was a wiretap uh, placed so that somebody could be a man in the middle for communications. And what they were doing is they were manipulating the local uh, narcotics market by uh, intercepting any communications that were talking about amounts or prices, uh, and then they were changing those and then passing the message along. So all of these scams are very similar to things that happen uh, these days. But uh, does anybody have a guess for a general time frame for when these three scams happened? Late 1800s. Yeah, these were all uh, on the um, Telegram network. So all of that is to say, 
What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. The TTPs for um, financially motivated fraud and crime, it really doesn't evolve that much. The tools and the techniques, or the tools themselves evolve, um, but a lot of it is just a rehashing of things that have already been done. All right, so let's move quite a bit forward in time. Let's move to the 60s. Uh, and talk about purchasing fraud. Um, this is, of course, before uh, the internet, really before ARPANET, uh, and uh, these are very early exchange networks that were between distributors and suppliers, or, uh, suppliers and manufacturers. Um, and they were uh, EDIs and VANs, electronic data interchanges and value-added networks. And here's typically how the it initially, these worked. Uh, you would have a supplier of hard drives, uh, and then they would supply it to the producer of computers, and then uh, payment orders and invoices would be exchanged over the EDI network. Now, a problem with this is because of, it was a very early electronic network, uh, there were a lot of issues with it, a lot of bugs. Uh, so you had to have employees constantly checking and verifying um, a lot of these automated invoices and payments to make sure they were correct. Well, that led to issues with employees using the system to uh, sort of fudge some of the numbers and embezzle from these companies. So then vans were introduced. These are third parties that would um, operate your EDI network for you, and uh, they would take out the local employees, and they had um, uh, uh, routine audits that they would do and then give to the, comp the two companies, the producer and the supplier. Um, and then the, if there were any fraudulent documents found uh, that were entered into the network by a company at one of the other um, uh, end of the system, then they would report that uh, as part of their service. All right, so moving to the next decade, this is uh, where we really start seeing uh, telecom, banking, and early internet um, crime. So about 1970, it's not known exactly when he invented it, uh, but uh, Al, Gil Al Gilbertson invented uh, Blue Box. Does anybody here not know what a Blue Box is? Okay, so a Blue Box, uh, it's a device that produces a very particular tone, um, and the old telecom networks uh, would be able to um, hear that tone and then interpret as um, either uh, returning change or making your call free or uh, making a long distance call free, something like that. So um, it's used to, uh, to commit fraud against the telephone network. Now this is where uh, organized crime really started upping their electronics game. They got together with Al Gilbertson and uh, he got orders for uh, the mafia in Las Vegas uh, to, uh, for him to build them a whole bunch of these blue boxes. Because what they were doing, uh, a lot of their work in Vegas at that time, was uh, bet taking. And they would do a lot of it over long distance phone lines. So you can imagine how much money this would be saving the mafia. And uh, he added some, some pretty cool features. He made it so it fit inside of a cigarette case so you could hide it. And then he made a kill switch that fried the board uh, in case they wanted to dump it and get rid of it real quick. Does anybody recognize what this is? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So um, that tone I was talking about that the blue box produced, it just so happens that uh, Captain Crunch made a toy whistle that produced it uh, perfectly. So you no longer had to have this like ungainly set of electronics or build or solder anything yourself. You could just get a kid's toy. Now, the person who found out that this works, or is credited with that, is uh, John Draper. He's also known as Captain Crunch. Um, and uh, Esquire did um, an interview with him and uh, produced, it was pretty much a how-to. How do I hack the telecom system? And after this, uh, freaking, uh, which is hacking telecom systems, uh, just completely exploded. There were uh, lots of groups that started up, uh, a lot of meetings in person started up of different people that wanted to exchange information. Um, and I should mention that even though 71 was when Esquire published uh, the instructions for making a blue box along with some other stuff, uh, freaking and toll fraud had been going on since the 50s. It's just like only people who were really, really, really into the telephone network did it, and there weren't that many of them. 
1972, we come to our first drug transaction on the internet. Uh, so Stanford students in Artificial Intelligence Lab and ARP, um, that were connected to ARPANET, they used their ARPANET account to sell a small amount of marijuana to some other students on ARPANET and MIT. So uh, I guess that's the predecessor to Silk Road. Uh, in 73, we saw a huge um, uh, embezzlement and uh, fraud. I guess it was the, the reason why it was so big was because this was the first um, electronic accounting system, which, the, I mean, the computers needed for it took up like an entire room. Uh, but uh, it was started in 1964, but it was found in 1973 that uh, managers were going in and changing electronically uh, a lot of the, uh, the funding corporation's accounting information and then, of course, embezzling the uh, leftover funds. Uh, that same year, the chief teller at New York's Dime Savings Bank uh, did not actually get away with the money, um, but uh, he was found to be using a computer to embezzle over $1.5 million. Um, and these were the really the first two financial crimes um, with banking institutions uh, that were electronically based. All right, so now we'll start talking about like the precursors to the dark nets, the proto dark nets. So the term dark net is not a new term. Uh, it's been around since the 70s. And they were built as dark nets by default. So uh, you had ARPANET, and then you had all of these other networks that ARPANET would feed information to, but could not talk back to ARPANET for security reasons. Um, and uh, those, those are what the term darknet meant in the 70s. Uh, a lot of these uh, would later connect to each other and start forming what we now know as the internet. All right, so the 80s and 90s is where a lot of the fun begins. Uh, it was the wild, wild west. Uh, there was a, a, a lot of telecom, television, and internet hacking. We see the rise of hacker collectives. I'm sure some of you recognize some of these names. Uh, Loft Heavy Industries up in Boston, uh, Chaos Computer Club in Germany, uh, Legion of Doom, uh, Cult of the Dead Cow, Masters of uh, Deception, and probably the largest hacker collective even to date, the uh, Chinese honker was it was thousands, thousands of kids. And of course, with movies like War Games, Hackers, and Sneakers, uh, the media and just the general public really started be, to become aware of hacking and cybercrime. We also had an increase in reader and journalist technical aptitude. Uh, so before, like if you start doing um, finding, trying to find journal articles or um, uh, entries in newspapers for early cybercrime, it's almost non-existent because there were no journalists covering it, um, and they didn't really have the technical chops to be able to cover it properly. Um, and then we also saw telecom and TV stream hacks. If you were in Chicago, and what year was that, Johnny? Yeah, it was the early 80s. Yeah, where um, a television uh, stream got overpowered um, by, uh, I guess, TV pirates. Uh, we still don't, nobody knows who did it, um, if, except the person who did it. Uh, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was very sophisticated for the time. Nobody knew that it was actually possible. So it was pretty cool. And now we start seeing the government's responses to this new emergence of cybercrime. Um, in 81, there was the first Interpol training seminar for investigators of computer crime. Uh, in 84, the U.S. passed the Comprehensive Crime Control Act. Uh, this was the precursor to the CFAA. <coughs> and it actually included uh, lines for electronic fraud and electronic crime. In 86, the CFAA uh, was released, which is a horribly, horribly broad law. Uh, Technically, to violate the CFAA, you don't even have to touch a computer. So, to be considered hacking. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's thrown left and right. Yep. 
Uh, also the same year, the um, OECD uh, released their recommendations on combating computer-related crime. Uh, and this is important because <coughs> it's what the Council of Europe based their recommendations on, and um, it's what most European countries then formed their cybercrime laws on. Again, they're using laws from 89. And we're using laws from 86, so I guess we were like cybercrime hipsters. Yeah, yeah, oh God. Um, and uh, of course, a couple other countries then right after that, based on the um, European uh, Council's recommendations, um, instituted their laws. Um, and I thought this was really neat. In 98, um, the G8 summit found that there were a lot of countries that were implementing these laws, but their investigators couldn't do anything about it because they didn't have any technical skills. So the G8 set up a 24-7 hotline for a high-tech crime investigation, and you could just call an expert that was on staff at the G8 and say, like, this is what's going on. How do I actually prosecute this, or how do I investigate this? All right, so now we, we start getting the quasi-darknets. This is going to be the throwback, so all the older people in the room, uh, I'm sure, will have fun in this section. BBSs, IRC, Usenet, and peer-to-peer -peer networks. <coughs> Who remembers Razor? You know they're still they're still producing rips. Razor is still around. Yeah, yep. Um, so there were in the early bulletin board systems, uh, there were things called elite BBSs, uh, and these were uh, membership only. The admins were typically pretty condescending. Uh, they didn't like noobs getting in. Uh, and they, of course, wanted to keep out anybody they thought might be government. Um, and uh, typically what was traded there is uh, wares, that's pirated software, um, freaking tutorials, hacking tutorials, uh, cracking, uh, credit card numbers were traded. <coughs> and um, there was a lot of uh, fraud techniques that were traded as well, um, identity fraud mostly. And uh, it, it did have a membership application model for these elite BBSs. But something great that came out of this scene was the demo scene. Uh, this is where uh, these different groups that were ripping software and releasing it would have their own intros, and it was low-bit intros. And it would have some music uh, um, and some animation. And uh, this, is, this is one of the bigger groups, Accelerate, and they were based in Poland. But if you don't know what the demo scene is, go home, check it out. It's really cool. So, of course, the governments responded to these. In 1990, uh, there's what was called the Great Hacker Crackdown, and this is a global operation. Um, the biggest part of it in the U.S. was Operation Sun Devil, and that was cooperation between the FBI, <clears throat> Social Security, and a bunch of local offices. They not only targeted uh, elite BBSs, but they also targeted uh, frac easing. Uh, frac is the precursor to the 2600. Um, actually, FRAC is still releasing to this day. But they went in and they raided their offices, which was like some guy's garage, um, and uh, took all of their electronics and things like that. Um, and all they were doing were, was uh, producing an online magazine uh, where people could say, hey, uh, you know, I had this experience on this telephone network, or hey, here's how I built this piece of hardware, things like that. I mean, a lot of it was could be used to do illegal things, but publishing it in and of itself, information wants to be free. Um, and it had a massive chilling effect. A lot of the bulletin board systems uh, that were elite BBSs shut down after 1990. Between 94 and 95, uh, there was a further decrease uh, where the speed started to increase on the internet in, in general. Internet subboards, hubs, and chats became more popular than BBSs. Um, and uh, you could have multiple services that you're, being, that you're using with just one connection. Uh, for a BBS, it only allows one connection at a time, unless it was a really big BBS that had multiple uh, cards and connections coming into their house. Uh, and then, of course, we're, we saw the rise of Usenet groups. 
Um, these are also where we started seeing the type of cybercrime that was mass spamming, forgery, which is spam forgery, where you say you are somebody and you're uh, spoofing the email address or the Usenet address of that person. Um, we also started seeing the first large-scale bot wars on Usenet. So it would typically be spam bots versus cancel bots. So the spam bots would be like trying to sell stuff or trying to scam somebody. Uh, and then the cancel bots were set up by admins to automatically find those and cancel their Usenet postings. Uh, and then that evolved into uh, forged cancels versus aliasing out. What would happen is uh, the uh, spammers would just start canceling an entire Usenet uh, group's uh, postings, just all of them, as retaliation. And so uh, they started, uh, the admins started aliasing out automatically any Usenet user that uh, looked like he was doing this sort of activity. In 94, we saw a huge decline in Usenet uh, due to a few things. Um, endless summer, uh, or endless September, uh, was mostly AOL's fault. Uh, it's when AOL really started pushing uh, Usenet availability, um, and it was just a massive influx of new users to the Usenet community. Um, and uh, the uh, what that did is it pushed out a lot of the older guys, and then the spamming increased because there was much less moderation, uh, and it just became unusable for a lot of reasons. Uh, you can still use it to get wares, uh, but uh, a lot of ISPs have just dropped their Usenet service. So it's only like third-party Usenet providers now. Uh, but that was mostly due to uh, child pornography being on the Usenet system, and uh, the New York AG just going after them really hardcore uh, and, and really uh, battering the ISPs. So they were like, we don't even want to deal with this and just dropped it. Oh, uh, it, was, uh, it was, so it started in September and they were like, oh, it's so 4chan, uh, when people say it's all summer up in here, it means that an influx of noobs because they're out of school. It's the same deal. Uh, so it started in September, and then it just never stopped. And they were just like, we're just now being flooded with all kinds of people who don't know how to use the system properly and are just like spewing trash. This was probably the most popular uh, uh, Usenet um, hacking tool. And uh, what it did is it it allowed you to pretty much become a Usenet admin on any Usenet group. Uh, and some of the features were you could auto-cancel any posting that was placed in the group. Uh, you can replace the body text of any message. That's fun. Uh, if an admin uh, deletes one of your postings, it would automatically repost it for you. Um, and it just gave a whole bunch of other uh, Usenet admin powers to uh, any user that used it. All right, IRC. Who remembers that logo? And then when it would pop up and tell you, hey, you've been using this for free, uh, and before you closed it, you clicked on the creator's nose and it made a little noise. That was a, that was a fun little. Uh, all right, so IRC, is, IRC was drama central. Uh, and there were a lot of forks, uh, forced forks, for a lot of uh, uh, nick collisions, uh, forced net splits. Um, and the reason why you would do this is uh, when you're creating a NIC collision, you can, uh, NIC are sh short for nickname. It's a nickname for nickname. Uh, but uh, you could use somebody else's nickname if you were able to cause a collision and you won out in that collision. And then you could you know, spam as them, you could do whatever. Uh, if they're an admin, it gave you admin powers in certain channels. Uh, but uh, another way that they would use to uh, take over a channel is they would force a net split. And what this is is automated load balancing for the IRC servers um, would create a split in where they're served, which would cause rooms that are already established to drop all of its users or some huge subset of its users. And if you're the first person in a, in a, new, in a room, then you become the admin of that room. So it was used to take over different channels. Uh, there was... There was any, there still is anything and everything you want that you can find on IRC if you actually trust uh, sending and getting info from people on there. Uh, but there's where's uh, really good music communities for trading music. 
Um, movies, of course, scanned, lots of scanned books, uh, porn, of course, uh, lots of malware, uh, and a lot of automated bots. Uh, there's even trivia bots, which are a lot of fun. Uh, and then, of course, drugs. Pound drugs on Downnet, like you could regularly see people buying and selling drugs. Um, also, there were some games that we would play. Spot the Fed was one of them, which, of course, devolved into everybody's a Fed. Uh, mute, mute the noob, somebody that came in and would be like, how I hack my grades uh, would get muted almost right away. Um, we would do red flag keyword seeding. Now this, this is back uh, you know, in the 90s, so this is way before the Edward Snowden revelations, where we would, uh, while we're typing out regular conversation, just drop red flags uh, because you know, we were paranoid and thought like the NSA was listening to this. Oh, they probably were. Uh, but uh, we'd be like, yeah, and then uh, we would go to uh, Jimmy's house to play Xbox, bomb the airport, and then we would you know, just throw stuff like that in there. OK, uh, some of these are probably familiar, right? My favorite was definitely Soul Seek, the little bird on the, the far end over there. That was a, a great music community. Is it still active? Oh, last time I tried to check, it was like half the rooms I used to go to weren't there. Oh, yeah, the rooms were like a bunch of Yeah. But the, that's the big thing. The community is awesome. Yeah. Um, a lot of um, like low-key music creators are on there. Uh, but all the other ones, uh, Bear Share, iMesh, uh, Frostwire, Azurus, Emul. I mean, if you want malware and viruses, go to those. LimeWire. Oh, Bonds. Yeah, yeah. Oh, how many how many variations of Kazal was there? And there was like Kazal Light, Kazal Light Plus. <laughs> uh, Nutella is still around uh, and actually heavily used. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. And then, of course, I can't talk about uh, quasi dark nets without talking about sneaker nets. And a lot of countries uh, that are still developing, or um, mostly South and Central America, and it's huge in China, is to uh, you actually go to markets to get your pirated software or uh, your pirated music or movies. And they would just be like on thumb drives or CDs in these buckets that were labeled. And you would just pick it up and buy it. Uh, in, in China, when I was there, it was really interesting. There would be guys that actually had these uh, giant carpets that were um, had all the USBs and CDs rolled up into it. And they would just come out and then unroll it, and then when they see, saw a cop coming, they would just roll it up and then go s to the other corner and then unroll it again. It was pretty great. Oh, yeah. Used to be Canal Street, but after September 11th, that kind of, yeah. All right, so now we'll talk about where uh, cybercrime markets actually started. These are digital criminal web bazaars. Uh, in about 2000, the counterfeit library started. Um, this is the precursor to the Carter Planet, which I'm sure a lot of you had heard of. Um, it was a diploma mill. Uh, you could go in and say, like, I want to be a graduate from Harvard, and then they would sell you a diploma. Um, and then they also gave a lot of tutorials and, um, uh, on how to, prov or how to do ID fraud and how to make money off of it. That evolved into uh, the Carter Planet, where there was a major focus on credit card related fraud. There was also a lot of ID fraud in there. Um, and the Russian community was just huge and very active. Um, in 2002, Shadow Crew, um, which evolved from uh, uh, TCL, which was uh, the, uh, the, the Carter's, I can't remember what the L was. Um, but uh, this one was interesting in that now they started verifying different vendors in the forum. Um, and uh, they s had stolen data for sale, credit cards, um, lots of ID fraud, uh, guides. Um, they sold 
packages. They were the first one to really sell packages of uh, personal IDs that had like social security number, mother's maiden name, um, uh, address, email address, things like that. Uh, of course, now we have law enforcement uh, kickback. Uh, between 03 and 05, there was a major focus globally um, on these, uh, these carding forums. Uh, Operation Firewall and Angular Fish were the two biggest. There were a whole bunch of forum shutdowns. But uh, what that did is, as you can expect, it just caused thousands more to spawn. Uh, now, they were smaller forums, and it was harder to uh, get intel from just one source. Now, you had to go through all these other different forums that were new. In 04 and 06, this started to change as um, Iceman, or Max Butler, uh, the guy who went to jail for forcibly patching a bunch of people's bind. <laughs> uh, but uh, he uh, took all of these other smaller forums, and he hacked them and their databases, and then merged them and then redirected it so everybody that used to go to those forums now had to go to his new larger forum. Uh, and then he started uh, offering new things like advertising spots and things like that. Uh, for uh, 2007 to 9, um, each of these forums now only live for about a year max. So it's constant whack-a-mole. Uh, if you're a researcher like me, uh, it's, it's very, very obnoxious. Because you know you'll have built up a, a persona or a sock puppet, and you're getting information from uh, these forums, and then law enforcement just shuts it down within a year. All right, so people have to pay for things uh, fraud related. So how did they start doing this? Uh, they're not going to do it through their personal PayPal, right? Well, I mean, some people do, and they get caught, and they're dumb. Uh, but some of the first digital currencies were. Uh, backed by gold, uh, where the company would say that, oh yeah, we have this golden reserve, and your digital currency is like you can trade it in for gold at any point in time. Uh, some of these did not actually have any golden reserve or were not enough. Uh, E-gold was probably the longest living and the biggest one. Uh, Pecunix, uh, they're still around, but they uh, moved off of the gold standard um, following the, the US, I guess. Um, iGolder, uh, that, that was pretty short-lived, but those three um, were used the most in these fraud forums uh, for paying for stuff. And um, by now they're all effectively defunct um, or have spun off into another uh, service. Between 06 and um, 2013, uh, the playing field for paying really changed. Uh, and the, what came out of um, these gold-backed currencies is one that was uh, purporting to be a bank itself. They're like, we're a legit financial institution, um, and it became very uh, popular in criminal forums and was labeled by law enforcement as the black market bank. Um, and you could probably guess where it was based, Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, it was indicted in just large-scale money laundering operations as well. So then now we can move to cryptocurrencies. There are a couple of them out there. Uh, did you talk about Kanye coin? Coinye? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's my favorite one. Uh, yeah, no, that's the best part. Like Kanye was very angry that his face was on a digital currency. Like Kanye loves Kanye. Why would he not want his face on it? I know, but Anonymous has a few of their own different coins. Dogecoin, that one's always fun. It's not. I should, I should put it down, down below. Yes. Okay. Why, why is it frozen? There we go. All right, so some of the biggest ones. Bitcoin, I'm sure, which people are most aware of. Uh, it was released in 2009 by no matter what the guy in Australia or Newsweek tells you, nobody knows who it actually is except the person themselves. Um, and uh, it, could, it could be a group of people, or it could be a singular person. Um, but yeah, we don't actually know. Uh, it definitely is the largest by market value right now um, and, and market cap. Uh, it's the primary darknet market currency. And uh, 
it uses an open ledger system, so it was not built with privacy in mind. Um, all of the transactions on the blockchain are fully visible, uh, and it's pretty easy with either stat analysis or OPSEC failures to find out who's doing transactions in Bitcoin. Uh, Litecoin uh, was, uh, it, there was an engineer at uh, Google, Charlie Lee, who wanted to learn more about cryptocurrencies. So as a hobby, he released in 2011 um, uh, his fork off of the Bitcoin code. It's nearly identical to Bitcoin, so it has the same privacy issues as well. Um, and then now it's become the fourth largest by market value. And it was just like this guy's hobby project, which I thought was pretty cool. Ethereum is probably my favorite cryptocurrency right now. Uh, it's fairly new, released in 2015, um, and uh, it has the second largest market value. It is blowing up right now. I think it's at like 240 today, uh, $240, when three weeks ago it was at like probably 70. So it's, it's blowing up along with Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, it is definitely more complex and ex extensible than Bitcoin. Uh, because Ethereum itself is not just a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's a blockchain-based, decentralized, Turing-complete virtual machine. So what you do with it is you create applications, one of which is the Ethereum currency, um, and that application lives in a de decentralized virtual machine, uh, which makes it very, very hard to take down. And then there are contracts involved which verify any changes that are made to it. Um, so it's very resilient to uh, hacking, being taken down, things like that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of cool stuff that are, that are going to come out of that. Uh, Monero, this is the probably the biggest in darknet market, or the second biggest in darknet market use. Uh, it was released in 2014. Uh, it's the sixth largest right now, but it's the fastest growing. Um, and it was built with privacy in mind. Uh, caveat, up until 2016, uh, between 2014 and 2016, they were using a um, ring signature structure that was flawed, so you can actually trace back um, a lot of those transactions. Uh, since 2016, they've um, implemented uh, a new signing structure that is uh, supposedly much more secure. Time will tell. Right, exactly. But yeah, but, but that, the ring-based signature was already known to be insecure. Like, I don't know why, whatever. All right, so for these cryptocurrencies, uh, there, there's definitely a lot of legitimate use, like remittances uh, um, across countries, uh, wiring money without waiting for the bank and the fees and all of that, um, and just being used as a modicum of, uh, or a, uh, a way to exchange things. Um, but there also are plenty of criminal uses for these uh, cryptography-based currencies. Uh, ransomware, I'm sure everybody uh, has uh, seen the WannaCry stuff going on. Uh, crypto coin mining uh, implemented in malware uh, so that you can use lots of other people's devices you've taken over uh, to mine Bitcoin. On that note, the latest IoT, like botnet surge, had a Bitcoin mining component, but it was taking over IoT devices which have like no processing power whatsoever. Uh, so we did the calculations, uh, and they were making, uh, if they were all running at full capacity, they were making probably, uh, was it 0.02 cents a day? Yeah, it was, it was uh, um, DVRs, refrigerators, and um, cameras. Yeah. So dumb. Uh, of course, money laundering is, is a use for cryptocurrencies and is used a lot. I have a whole other talk on just that, uh, and buying and paying for shady goods and services. All right, so with these, uh, with these moves for uh, crime activity to um, uh, cryptography-based uses, we have to have a structure for them to actually create so they're not on the clear net on these forums, again, getting constantly taken down and popped by law enforcement. So now we have dark nets by design. Uh, these started early on with uh, no like website component. Uh, it's a darknet that's focused strictly on like file sharing, chat, uh, messaging uh, securely, things like that. These are three pretty big ones. And then we have the actual full-fledged darknets that allow for websites as well. Um, and of course, there's Tor, but there's also a whole bunch of other ones. 
Um, a little bit about Tor, a lot of people know the Onion Router Network. Um, it was initially developed uh, in about 94 to 97, we don't know the exact dates, um, by the US Naval Research Lab and DARPA. And uh, it was publicly released in 2002. Uh, and then that's where the uh, Tor Foundation took over the development for it. Um, it uses multi-layered encryption aiming for anonymous communication. And the multi-layering is where the onion analogy comes in. Uh, it's definitely the largest darknet by traffic volume um, and has the uh, most darknet markets on it. I'm sure if you saw Johnny's talk, you saw that there are quite a few darknet markets out there. <laughs> Uh, so Freenet is another one. Uh, this one uh, has been around a while. It was released in 2000. Uh, it focused specifically on censorship-resistant communication and free speech. It was very much about um, not letting, especially governments, censor communications uh, and free speech. Uh, it uses a key-based routing protocol uh, instead of the onion-based routing protocol. Um, I2P, this is, I, I would say, this one is probably the largest after Tor. Uh, it was released in 2003, uh, and it, it's an anonymous network layer for other uh, common protocols, like you can use I2P for FTP, you can use it for, uh, I don't know why you ever would, ICMP, uh, a number of other protocols as well. Uh, and it uses uh, an extension of Tor anonymity called garlic routing, where it uses uh, different clusters of uh, uh, Tor implementations. Oh, also, uh, after the Snowden revelations, uh, I2P just blew up, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, NewNet, of course, this is a new project. Um, it was released in 2001. Uh, and this, in order for it to be a darknet, uh, it, it isn't if you leave all the default settings on. Uh, but if you uh, add the friend to friend, friend network topology to it, then it becomes a darknet. After the uh, PRISM leaks, this one also gained a lot of popularity. And then this one, I'm going to butcher the name on it, uh, Netsukuku. This is a, it's a Japanese name, but it's made by an Italian guy. I don't know. It was released in 2005. Uh, version 2.0 is in development. Uh, and the, uh, the gaps between version 1 and version 2 were huge. Uh, and uh, it uses, it's, it's interesting in that it uses its own routing protocol uh, called uh, QSpin, and then it uses its own DNS system and structure uh, called uh, and, and DNA. And uh, you should go look at the white papers for those because they're pretty cool um, spins on DNS and routing. Also, it's in super, super alpha. There's no large scale testing being done for it right now. Uh, zero net was a newer one, and it's interesting because it's based on Bitcoin cryptography, um, and it uses the BitTorrent network. Um, and it, it, what it's really aiming for is uh, takedown immunity, so that uh, if a government wants to do uh, a takedown for a market or a site, or there's a, a DMCA complaint or something like that, that it would be immune to that. Uh, Riffle is probably the coolest one for me right now. This is, uh, comes out of MIT Labs, uh, and it was just introduced last year. It claims that it's 10 times faster than Tor and much more secure than the Tor network. Uh, but it, again, it's an extreme alpha, and it's still in development. There's been no large-scale testing yet. But I really encourage people to keep up with that. Um, I can see Riffle uh, really overtaking Tor eventually. All right, so on the, now that we have these actual dark nets, we can start having marketplaces on top of them for shady goods and for regular goods, but we'll talk about the goods later. So one of the uh, first ones we saw, well, the first one we saw was the farmer's market, which came out of a clear net site called Adam Flowers. Uh, I don't know why they chose that name, uh, but they did all their transactions through uh, Hushmail, which was like an encrypted anonymous email service. Uh, but, of course, Hushmail was working with the feds, so that didn't work out so great. Um, but uh, they, they moved in 2010 to the Tor network and changed their name, of course. Uh, but it was the first true darknet market. Um, and they had, uh, like, actual customer service that you could message or call. Um, but they did take things like Cash, PayPal, Western Union, 
um, Igolder and Bacunix, which ended up getting a bunch of people busted, of course. Um, it had a bunch of users in a bunch of different countries, and it focused solely on drugs. You couldn't sell like ID theft or credit cards or things like that. It was just drugs. And then, of course, you know, Operation Atom Bomb. Uh, the DEA and law enforcement in Netherlands, Colombia, and Scotland uh, worked with Hushmal to intercept a bunch of uh, postal service packages. Um, and there ended up being eight indi indictments uh, with seven convictions, but the eighth guy died. So uh, the lead defendant, Mark Williams, was sentenced to 10 years in prison, which at the time was the longest sentencing for um, this type of crime. Uh, and then uh, another one of note, Atlantis. This was the first one to offer Litecoin support and started to allow more than drugs, which that was the major difference here. You could start selling, you see there's um, a lot of 32 Microsoft product keys for sale, and of course, a bunch of drugs. Uh, but uh, it produced its own marketing video. That looks like a legitimate like startup company web 2.0 like marketing campaign video. Oh god, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, so uh, Atlantis, um, so they were the first uh, exit scam. And what an exit scam is, is where, um, because you're putting your money into uh, the marketplace, a wallet that you have virtually a hot wallet um, on their structure, and then you're using that to purchase whatever you're purchasing. So they just wait until a whole bunch of people put a whole bunch of money into their temporary wallets and then shut the site down and run away with the Bitcoin. And this happens a lot. Silk Road, uh, they never got to that point. <laughs> uh, so it was the first modern darknet market that had um, an escrow service. Uh, they also had vendor reputation services. Um, they were shut down by law enforcement in 2013. Uh, the uh, owner, uh, or suspected owner, I mean, who here has seen The Princess Bride? Yeah, there's just one Dread Pirate Roberts, right? Yeah, there were, there were many different owners of the website. Uh, the last one just ended up caught with the bucket. Uh, but uh, Silk Road 2.0, by some of the former admins of Silk Road 1, uh, popped up uh, for about uh, six months, and then law enforcement shut that one down too. Uh, and there are also a lot of interesting ongoing investigations into law enforcement officers involved um, that stole a bunch of Bitcoin uh, during the investigation. Uh, and uh, the reason why that's funny is because earlier I mentioned that the transactions are fully visible and on the ledger. Like, come on guys, use your brain. All right, so what's, what's the current state of the dark net markets if like Silk Road uh, is shut down, Atlantis has exit scammed, um, Adam Flowers, the farmer's market, got shut down by law enforcement. So that like, like really snubbed uh, the uh, dark net market thing, right? Nah, there's like a whole bunch of them. This is half of the dark net markets that, um, this was a couple months ago. So uh, let's see, outlaw market just exit scammed. Uh, Mr. Nice Guy has exit scammed, uh, but uh, started up another website that people are still using. Um, the detox is down right now. We don't know what's going on with that. 
Um, and the real deal tends to go up and down a lot. Uh, but the real deal is where like the Yahoo hack and the MicroTorrent hack and um, a lot of other database uh, leaks were being sold by uh, the Dark Overlord. So uh, exit scams, Atlantis, Sheep Marketplace, Nucleus, Black Bank, Oasis, and about seven others. This happens all the time. It will continue to happen. Uh, and uh, this, the reason you do this is because why aren't you going to do it, right? They're giving you all this money, and then before law enforcement catches up with you, you might as well make off with the money. So the, uh, the law enforcement does take down a lot. Silk Road, Farmer's Market, Utopia, Hydra, Cannabis Road, uh, Babylon, those were all taken down by law enforcement. Um, there was also issues with uh, some of them being hacked. I mean, it's a juicy target, right? If they're keeping all these Bitcoin uh, you know, in their wallet, why don't you hack them and either blackmail them or steal their Bitcoin? Uh, so that happened to a, a bunch of other markets. Um, and then there are a bunch that are down and we don't know why. Uh, Agora, they shut down and they said it was due to, they believe there are large privacy flaws with Tor, but won't tell anybody what they think they are. Um, Infinity, Dark Rabbit, THC Market, and Haven, there's just been no news from the admins, like they got killed or something, we don't know. They just haven't shown up or talked to anybody. So the types of things you can get, uh, if you saw Johnny's talk, I'm sure he went over a lot of that. Uh, drugs, precursors for drug, drugs and lab equipment, uh, lots of stolen data, um, retail accounts, streaming accounts, bank accounts, uh, lots of counterfeit goods, counterfeit bullion, um, IDs, diplomas, uh, pirated software, uh, free software you can also buy if you want to, uh, malware, botnets, hacking for hire, crime tutorials, uh, weapons and firearms, which don't buy weapons and firearms from the dark net. We're in the US, they, like, they're, yeah, it's really easy to get them. <laughs> uh, some of the other things they had for sale, uh, and this was like, these are from today. Uh, Darknet optimized hardware Bitcoin wallet. So you can go to a Darknet market and then buy a hardware Bitcoin wallet that I'm sure has not been tampered with. Oh, and something else is, these are all three the same product. Um, three different prices, same vendor. What? <laughs> oh, old, ultimate and extreme. But it, it's, it's literally the same product. BitLocks only makes one version of their product. <laughs> uh, hack your school grading system uh, because they won't be able to tell who did it when only one person has their grade changed. Uh, the Wi-Fi hacker tool. So this one, I, I went through the features and I, I know what tool they're talking about. It's on GitHub for free. And they're, I don't know, selling it for $7.72. And this guy has like massive good ratings. So a lot of people were buying this. Iron Socket VPN, because you can totally trust a VPN you bought off the dark net. <laughs> You're right, right. From El Cartel. Jeez. Oh, and I like how the hack your school grading system is smart 666 tiger. Uh, stuff you can get on Amazon even cheaper. And books, you can buy books. The Secret, I mean, who doesn't want to buy The Secret from the dark net? <laughs> yeah, yeah, these books are free. Uh, but you can buy them if you want. Uh, Anarchist Cookbook, last edition. Because there was more than one edition. And, uh, and, well, and that's the last one. So you can only buy it once, I guess. All right, so let's look at, let's look at the future of dark net markets. So Dark Wallet is doing some pretty cool research, and uh, what Dark Wallet uh, allows for is it's a Bitcoin wallet, but it's trying to make Bitcoin more privacy-oriented for transactions. And it uses a uh, Diffie-Hellman implementation, which is pretty cool, you should go check it out, um, called Stealth Transactions, to hide the metadata about transactions. Um, it uses multi-signature cooperative wallets, 
um, which it would be great for darknet markets uh, because it allows not just uh, two parties um, that like uh, one of the admins and uh, one of the sellers, but it also can have the buyer as part of that process for signing. Um, and uh, again, that could be rolled into an escrow uh, for the darknet market. Um, also, it uses coin join mixing, which adds another layer of obfuscation, obfuscation for um, transactions. It is an extreme alpha. Don't trust any of the privacy. It's some really cool ideas, but uh, yeah. Oh, unless you want to do something super shady, then go right ahead. Uh, so Dash, formerly Darkcoin, the, they're doing uh, network premixing. Uh, they're using X11 instead of uh, SHA-256, which Bitcoin uses. Um, and uh, it's the fifth largest uh, for market value. Uh, I would say expect darknet markets to start picking this up. Shadowcoin, which was another privacy-oriented uh, coin, but it had the same issues as Monero with its uh, ring signature. Um, they were building a platform called Umbra, which was like an, an all-in-one where it had uh, encrypted chat, uh, a secure market, um, it had a mobile feature, which none of the other markets do right now, um, a currency exchange, and uh, it was on both Tor and I2P. Um, they've now shut down both of those projects and are starting one with the same features uh, called Particle, but they've like completely rebranded. Uh, they've actually got a, um, a professional marketing team now and they have investors, so it's, uh, I don't know, they're going legit. Uh, but it's open source too, so you can review the code. Um, and it's a decentralized privacy platform for e-commerce is how they're building it. Uh, it's based on the Bitcoin code base, and it uses uh, two-token currency for anonymity. Uh, the messaging system, again, is end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and they've already gotten 750,000 in their development round. Uh, so I don't know. Keep an eye out on this one. But that's, that's uh, their uh, visual mock-up for what they want it to look like, the marketplace. Kind of looks like Etsy. Yeah. Uh, they do have some competition from uh, Zcash and Komodo, another platform. Uh, there are some differences with these platforms and with the Zcash currency. Uh, Zcash is not nearly as big as any of the other privacy-oriented currencies in terms of market value, uh, but it's uh, the way in which it's implementing transaction verification uh, is, is very clever and does hide transaction uh, data. And uh, one other thing to note is the CEO of the project is Zuko Wilcox O'Hearn. Who knows who Zuko is? He, this, this, this guy is like the crypto god. He's a crypto guru. He knows what he's doing. Um, he was uh, the lead developer for the Tahoe Laughs, which is a, um, uh, a secure file sharing service. Um, he invented the ZRTP protocol, um, and he was the primary for the Blake2 crypto hash function. Uh, this guy is legit. And Komodo, the platform, it uses the same technology as, as, as Zcash for their proof of work mechanism. Uh, and it also has a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange system. Uh, along with that is their pegged uh, asset exchange system. And what that does is it supports 32 different fiat currencies, like actual currencies. And you can um, go between cryptocurrency and actual currency pegged by the Komodo coin um, anonymously, is what they're promoting. So that, that could definitely change things, especially for... Um, law enforcement and privacy advocates. All right, so uh, what is law enforcement doing about this new world of encryption and cryptography? Uh, well, we had the first crypto wars, right? Um, now we're entering into, I think, Crypto Wars 2.0. Uh, one of the things that we've seen the FBI do on the Tor network specifically is they had a massive anti-child abuse operation called Operation Playpen. Now, it sounds great on the surface. Like, we definitely want them to go after these people and, and take care of this problem. The issue is how they went about it. Um, they seized the Darknet website. Thanks. The Darknet website uh, that was running this child porn ring. 
um, and they kept it running for two weeks so they could gain more information about the users. So the FBI is running a child porn site, already kind of iffy. Um, and they went and got a, a warrant um, to try and find out more information about these users by uh, implementing malware on their computers. So they got a warrant, but it was a single warrant that was for a specific geog geographic location in Virginia. Uh, they ended up uh, infecting um, or exploiting at least 8,000 computers in 120 different countries. Like, come on, guys. Uh, the warrant was later ruled invalid, uh, and many of the cases that they had built against these uh, child porn uh, guys uh, are being dropped in court because of this. So they're just not being caught. Now, Rule 41 was what was limiting geographically uh, what they were doing and why the warrant was invalid. So what happened? Uh, the Department of Justice uh, pushed through a change in 2016 uh, to uh, do add some additions to Rule 41 that allows for these global hacking warrants. Um, and uh, it allows for a mass malware infection as long as it's um, in the name of uh, either terrorism or uh, combating um, a, uh, a child pornography. And uh, it also allows for end user hacking of botnet zombies, which are you know, innocent users. These people have done nothing wrong. They have no crime, but they're allowed to be hacked now. Um, and it also allows for judge shopping. Like if they go to one judge to get uh, the warrant and the judge is like, this is way too broad, what are you doing? They can just go to another judge in another district. Um, and it doesn't have to be the district that the crime was committed in. So there's some serious issues with those changes. <laughs> yes, yes it does. Uh, and the UK, not to be outdone by the US, uh, introduced the uh, Investigatory Powers Act uh, last year. It's also called the Snoopers Charter. Uh, so it allows for bulk uh, communication data interception and collection. Um, it gives police, like small town police, the power to carry out targeted hacking and data interception. Um, and it also allows for bulk hacking in the name of national security, which is anything they say national security is. Also, they've made it illegal for uh, service providers to notify a user if their data is being requested. So uh, privacy, what privacy? Uh, so now, now for most ISPs and service providers and telecom providers, like it's part of their standing, uh, standard operating procedure to say, hey, we're giving away your data in this manner for this reason. Um, but uh, nope, not anymore. All right, so Crypto Wars 2.0, intelligence versus individual security and privacy. Uh, the NSA, I'm sure we all know, uh, pushed NIST to, and paid RSA to accept a, a dual um, EC crypto standard that had a weakness in the RNG, so it allowed for prediction and weakened the encryption. Uh, that was really shitty. Uh, but uh, it, to RSA's credit, uh, it, it wasn't they weren't completely complicit in it. Uh, the FBI has also um, asked, you know, we know the judge in California uh, to force Apple to compromise its own encrypted device to break the encryption on it so they can get access to it. Uh, and then there are uh, various governments calling for encryption backdoors that can only be used by law enforcement because that's how backdoors work, right? Um, also, there's been lots of, uh, uh, I guess, rabble-rousing, saber-rattling, uh, war-mongering about the threat of encryption and how like terrorists are using encryption left and right, and we can't find out how they're communicating. Uh, well, I mean, it turns out most of the research done in that area finds that, A, they're not really using encryption, and B, the encryption they are using is really crappy. So. That is to say, what will all of this mean for the future of the internet, darknets, privacy, and security for both criminals and regular citizens? What's the answer here? We want law enforcement to be able to take care of crime, especially if it's starting to use uh, these uh, encryption protocols and uh, advanced cryptography. But we also want individuals to be able to hold on to their privacy. 
and have that freedom of communication there? Uh, I don't have the answer, but it's something we're definitely going to start grappling with in this next round of crypto wars. So uh, questions. And if you uh, don't have any questions right now, you can definitely uh, contact me either on Facebook or via email, uh, and uh, I'll answer your questions that way. No. Sorry, I can tell you what I did is um, I waited until Bitcoin and Ethereum both got to where I was happy. Um, I cashed out and then bought um, Dash and Zcash. Um, see, Ethereum just they they have some internal uh, debates going on with their developers that depending on which way it goes, they could take a nosedive. So. Any other questions? All right, well thank you very much.